Queen's College London. So, Thank you. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's fantastic to talk at this meeting. It's a great way to get stimulation and questions and not always diktat. Tablets of stone should be thrown out. So um, my declarations of interest in terms of this talk and most is enthusiasm and optimism. And it's something one needs in liver disease because other ones once becomes a nihilist. And it is really important not to be nihilistic. So I'm going to try and cover two areas very briefly in this 15 minutes. One, acute liver failure, which is totally different to acute on chronic liver failure or critically ill cirrhotics. This is a cohort of patients who do not have underlying liver disease. They present with an acute deterioration in liver function, hyperacute, acute, and subacute. Your clinical acumen is required to separate subacute sometimes from acute on chronic. They have ascites, they're yellow, and they've got splenomegaly. So it all comes down to history investigations. But the important thing is acute liver failure can get better without transplantation. And increasingly, we transplant less and less for the hyperacute liver failure as our medical management gets better. And the transplant criteria are those of O'Grady uh, from the UK, Clichy from Paris, they still hold good although we're now moving towards more dynamic tests using more complex uh, biomarkers. Acute on chronic, by, con by contrast, is a much more, by its definition, chronic state. You have a cirrhotic, seriously fibrotic liver. They go through that acute decompensation with ascites, possibly varices, we'll hear of later. And then they get another acute insult with further liver dysfunction and other or extrahepatic organ dysfunction. And they are a different group. We manage them differently in terms of some of their management. So in terms of acute liver failure and hemodynamics, they are nearly always volume deplete. They've been vomiting, they're unwell. I use crystalloid to resuscitate them. I'm not going to get into a crystalloid colloid debate, but for acute liver failure, they are often, because they've been vomiting, saline depleted, and you actually need to give them normal saline. So assess your patient at the bedside as you always would. Your vasopressors are norepinephrine, followed by either vasopressin at low dose or terlipressin at low dose, usually when you hit about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 mics per kilo per minute. It is as any other seriously unwell, critically ill patient. Do just be aware of hypoxic hepatitis. It's rare, it's respiratory failure, poor left ventricular function, and a secondary acute liver insult. The liver will get better if you sort out the heart and lungs. So almost don't fuss about the liver, focus on the heart and lungs. And this is a young gentleman uh, in the top right who presented with an INR of seven, marked transaminitis, bilirubin, encephalopathy by virtue of a decreased GCS, lactate and ammonia. He had viral myocarditis and was managed actually with VA ECMO to a successful outcome. So it's not always straightforward. So in terms of coagulation, um, these patients, as with acute on chronic, have balanced coagulation. We measure the INR and the APTR and the fibrinogen. We fail to measure the procoagulant factor, as anticoagulant factors, protein C, protein S. And as such, quite often, they don't bleed. The ones that bleed, by rule of thumb, very low fibrinogens, very low platelets. You see them oozing from lines. Otherwise, do not give coagulation factors. Your INR is what dictates prognosis. So please don't correct it. And ROTEM viscoelastic testing is really quite useful, and you see the data there. Raised intracranial pressure is an issue. It's a decreasing issue in Europe, but in some other developing countries where hemofiltration continuous modes of renal replacement therapy aren't available, it's still an issue. Be cautious, your patients at risk are those with grade three, four encephalopathy, the younger person, the hemodynamically unstable person, and the one who is inflamed and hyperaminemic. They are your risk group. We would now monitor them with transcranial Dopplers to assess for their risk factor. We rarely need an ICP bolt. From having done it frequently in my early career, I'm now doing it never. In fact, I think I wouldn't be competent anymore. So 
Renal replacement therapy, one slide on that. You can use it to decrease uh, ammonia. It's a water-soluble product. Just use it. It is one of the indications for early renal replacement therapy, both in acute on chronic and in acute liver failure. So consider that. And age is wonderfully protective, not for many diseases, but for cerebral edema it is. My brain shrinks, I have more space in my cranium, and thus I am at less risk of cerebral edema. So there are some advantages of growing old. And in terms of the management, nowadays we keep them normothermic, we use hypertonic saline to clamp them up the sodium. You probably need to go up incrementally over time so you don't get that reverse osmolar impact going from 140, 145, 150, and if necessary, above with bolus hypertonic saline. And that is your management of these patients. Hypothermia is not efficacious, as you see from that slide, except when your back is against the wall. So now moving on to acute on chronic. This is the common disease. Acute liver failure is rare. This is your everyday bread and butter. And as we've said, you're going along happily, you have an acute insult. It's really difficult to separate this chronic deterioration. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it isn't. In some ways, it's a nuance. They end up in your ITU with critically ill cirrhotic. The intensive care management, I commend you to this uh, review by my colleague Will Vernal, addressing the issues. And by and large, it's straightforward. It is what we do for everybody. There are a few nuances, however, which I would draw your attention to and we will take out further. There has been discussion about the role of non-selective beta blockade and some of the studies are now beginning to suggest that that isn't detrimental but it's actually potentially beneficial which is fascinating when you think about the role now of beta blockers in sepsis potentially and in other critically ill patients. <laughs> small study worth commenting on, GCSF. One study out of uh, India suggested benefit. We now have this study which suggests no benefit. So I don't use it. I think there is equipoise, but I think the evidence for use of such agents is not there and I wouldn't suggest them in your standard practice. This is a nicely designed study. I want to talk about alcoholic hepatitis briefly because I think it's a cohort of patients who we see a lot of. And I don't know what your practice is, but we've seen an awful lot more since the advent of COVID where people perhaps isolated at home drank more. The uh, Lille score, oops, my apologies, I hit the wrong button, is really excellent in terms of uh, prognostication, perhaps particularly when you've chosen to give steroids and you can look at that response and that delta leal along with delta bilirubin. I still use, in very old-fashioned terms, the Glasgow Alcoholic Hepatitis Score. It's really quite easy to use at the bedside to determine steroid use. And for those patients with a score above nine, I will still use steroids. There are some cohorts that do not respond. The Indian subcontinent does not see benefit from steroids. So there is something about the phenotype of these patients. And they are an ideal group as we go forward for precision medicine in really understanding how to individualize the therapy for this cohort of patients. Respiratory failure. What you'll see perhaps more of is the hydrothoraces usually fluid going through from your ascites through holes in your diaphragm. Be aware that gets infected like your ascites, so it is at risk of SPP. You can often drain it by draining the ascites. Be cautious about intercostal chest tubes. There are varices there. And if you put a chest tube through an intercostal varix, it's deeply unpleasant. Um, solvable, but deeply unpleasant. <laughs> Be aware also of hepatopulmonary syndrome. It's where you shunt through intraparenchymal AV shunts within your lungs. They're beautiful. You sit them up and they desaturate. You lie them down and their saturations go up. Um, they respond to high flow oxygen. There are no therapeutic interventions other than considering transplantation. <laughs> 
So you just need to manage it and you need to recognise it. And it is under-recognised. So I would almost suggest an echo by default because you need to assess their heart and their right-sided function. And you should look in terms of bubble echo for shunting. So cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, diastolic dysfunction, recent changes in the definition to include systolic dysfunction. It probably is more important than we give it credit for. There is some data beginning to come out suggesting it is related to ongoing ischemic heart disease and heart failure and may have an impact post-transplant. So something to consider more than perhaps we did as an innocent bystander in the past. Do think about the other causes of cardiomyopathy, alcohol and hemochromatosis, and do consider pulmonary hypertension, arterial and venous. The venous is easy. You've got to put a PA catheter in. You measure all your pressures. It's lovely. There is an indication for PA catheterization in this cohort. If it's venous, you offload them. If it's arterial, you use pharmacological therapy. So echo BNP useful. In terms of um, the diagnostic criteria, you see them here in terms of mean arterial pressure, but the Mayo group, who are really the doyens of pulmonary hypertension, are increasingly recognising that it's not so much the absolute mean pulmonary arterial pressure, it's the pulmonary vascular resistance that determines your outcome. So it's what your heart is doing. Once your cardiac index is going down, you are in a really bad place. You are probably unlikely to survive this. You're not going to survive transplant. If you've still got a high cardiac in index, you're hyperdynamic, you can be considered for transplantation. And that's important. And this really nice uh, controlled trial looking at pharmacotherapy and showing significant benefit with a decrement in PA pressure. So that sildenafil, bosantin, prostacycline nebulizers, we have treatment options. If you want to use terlipressin as your presser rather than norepinephrine, this single centre study would suggest you could. I don't. I think terlipressin has side effects as a sole agent, which are above norepinephrine. And as such, I will always start with norepinephrine and consider addition. The nature of fluid, I really don't want to go into. But there is some evidence, and we need to recognise that evidence. So, for... This is Manu Malbrain's slide. I do like it. <laughs> For paracentesis, use albumin. For type 1 hepatorenal failure, acute kidney injury, there is evidence for albumin. For the others, the evidence is much more tenuous. And you have to look at the literature and decide for yourselves at the moment. Um, this is the entire study. Does prophylactic albumin work? The answer is no. That doesn't mean that treatment albumin doesn't work, but prophylactic doesn't. And I would just draw your attention to this message that's coming through quite a few studies now, and I will speed up, Chairman, but pulmonary edema and respiratory failure is being seen. You need to assess the volume status if you're using albumin. It's not benign if you're using it regularly every day. Please assess and avoid these complications. Then you will see the benefit, not the detriment. Um, this nice study, 5% albumin versus normal saline in septic shock associated with cirrhosis, shows a benefit in terms of outcome, as you see here. Um, the uh, patients who didn't respond to the mean arterial pressure of 65, the uh, investigators could choose their own therapy, so quite a bit of crossover. This study, by contrast, 20% albumin versus plasma light, no difference. I think we have equipoise. This study, really nice from uh, Florence Wong, showing clear benefit for terlipressin plus albumin for acute renal failure in uh, liver disease, but again, this respiratory feature coming through. Early treatment, please can I suggest if you're going to treat, you treat early. All of the benefit is seen with early treatment and lower grades of encephalopathy. Don't wait for a bit and a creatinine of 300. Your liver doesn't produce creatine. You've got decreased muscle mass. Go early. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to skip this because of time. Encephalopathy and chronic liver disease, it should not kill you. Manage the airway. By and large, 99% of them do not get cerebral edema. They only get that if they've got a really low sodium, they're fitting, they've got a sudden change in ammonia from a child PUA with the tips. So please, admit them, treat them, they'll get better. And they're clotting exactly the same as acute liver failure. So, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is teams that make it work. It's always pushing forward. And it's always considering that we must move the evidence base forward to improve outcome of this cohort. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Weldon. Uh, the floor is now open for maybe uh, one or two questions from anyone from the audience. There's a question Please here. Use uh, the microphone. Do we have a microphone? No. Maybe not. just shout, sir. Just and I'll call it out. So encephalopathy, I think, has been covered by someone else. No, it isn't. Oh my gosh, I thought it was. Okay, so encephalopathy um, for chronic liver disease. I don't use rifaximin in ITU because I'm nearly always using antimicrobials, which no doubt Xavier will be covering later. So in the context of using systemic antimicrobials, I don't use rifaximin. Once I've got them off antimicrobials, I will consider rifaximin. And it has an evidence base in the ongoing management of your encephalopathic patient, but not whilst I've got them in ITU and they're critically ill. It does more uh, harm than good because they land up with sepsis and they succumb. So, so I think there, your take there, on that? there are two bits of this. One, we need to get better at managing sepsis versus inflammation. Two, we, if we're going to use steroids, the Indian phenotype is different to the UK phenotype, very clearly. We need to be aware that if they're on long-term steroids, i.e. they're a bilirubin responder, their bilirubin is coming down, then your risk of CMV and aspergilla, which again will probably be covered later, goes up. There is some real world data suggesting if you've got someone, you bring them into hospital and their bilirubin's plummeting, they don't need steroids. If, however, they're one of the flat group, then steroids is possibly worth a trial. But review it at seven days. Don't just go on and on to no effect. Thank you. Uh, Ziad from the UK. Um, thank you, Julia. Excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask you a question regarding the how you differentiate between alcoholic hepatitis and decompensated liver cirrhosis, because I find it incredibly hard. Um, and I just wondered whether you had any tips. So in simple terms, um, there's the cirrhotic alcoholic hepatitis, there's the less cirrhotic alcoholic hepatitis, but the features really are a really high white cell count, um, fever, liver which is painful, and a history usually of stopping drinking three weeks before admission because they were already feeling ill. Whereas the chronic deterioration with alcohol, they carried on drinking to admission. And it's that classic thing you say, do you drink? No. When did you have your last drink? Two or three weeks ago. Liver biopsy is the gold standard though. Transjugular. Thank you very much for your excellent speak. Uh, we need to talk, we need to move on. So the next speaker is um, Thierry Gusteau from Belgium. Uh, welcome, who's going to talk to us about management of varical bleeding. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, good morning. I will talk about a classical complication of cirrhotic patient, but not so frequent now. Um, Javier will talk about infection more frequent now due to the fact that we have prophylaxis and then this uh, complication occurs less frequently. Then when you apply the gold standard treatment, your prognosis associated with viral bleeding remains at the level of 15 to 20 percent at six weeks. And uh, the main predictors of uh, early death or re-bleeding is the severity of uh, cirrhosis uh, measured by the chai puk score or higher MEL score. And when you have a, a, a MEL score above 19, you have a, a mortality rate at six weeks of 
And also, another predictor of rebleeding or death is the degree of portal hypertension uh, demonstrated by the hepatic venous pressure gradient, HVPG, higher than 20. Um, and uh, also, when you, you, you have a patient with a variceal bleeding, uh, first of all, you think about endoscopy, but endoscopy must be made in a safe clinical si situation. You must be, uh, you must resuscitate your patient, stabilize before the endoscopy. Uh, f of course, you must put the patient on a middle care or uh, in ICU due to the fact that it can deteriorate very rapidly. You can have a, a large intravenous access if you need um, volume therapy or transfusion. And also, the important thing is that you must protect the airway. Uh, and there is at least uh, three uh, situations that you, you use this uh, intubation. is when you have vomiting blood, you have uh, unstable, a shock, or you have a, a, a altered consciousness, hepatic encephalopathy, and so on. Uh, you must perform, all, of course, some tests. Uh, and also microbiological uh, samples. I will explain this because uh, uh, infection is uh, very associated with virus cell bleeding. What about the transfusion? Um, it's demonstrated several years ago that the restrictive strategy uh, with a goal of hemoglobin of seven is better than uh, uh, hemoglobin between eight and nine. Um, it's demonstrated first in animals that if you transfer, transfer more the animal, you increase the portal pressure and you uh, increase the probability to have a rebleed. Yeah. And here it's a, it's a large study public, published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, that combined peptic ulcer and, and virus cell bleeding. And as you see, when you, 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 your goal is seven, it's, bad, it's better in terms of survival. Uh, and uh, when you look to subgroup analysis here, you see that um, the uh, restrictive strategy is better for child B and A patient. It's not the case for child C. There is not a lot of patient in child C uh, in this cohort, but also uh, the, 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 when you have a so sick patient, it's difficult to have an effect in so on survival, of course. Um, what about the, the, the coagulation factor is, as Julia said, we are not able to measure uh, at the bedside uh, very strictly uh, the coagulation status of the patient. And there is no reason to put fresh frozen plasma or uh, platelets in, in this situation. There is no demonstration that there is an infect and you can increase the portal pressure. And there is two randomized control trial using uh, recombinant factor uh, 7A, Novo 7, it's negative in this situation. And then uh, the, the proven therapies in this situation is a cadre therapy that combines vasoactive treatment, antibiotics, endoscopy, and preemptive tips. First of all, for the vaso vasoactive treatments demonstrated several years ago that is beneficial. You have three options, telepressin, somatostatin, or octreotide at this dosage, and uh, when you perform a, a meta-analysis, you see that the combination treatment is endoscopy plus vasoactive treatment is better than endoscopic alone it's in terms of, uh, of survival. Um, when you compare the three vasoactive drugs, there is no demonstration uh, differences between these three. Uh, and the duration of the treatment is between two to five days. Why? Because the, the window of, uh, of the high probability to have a rebleed is five days. Then you must cover the patient for five days, even if you have a good endoscopic treatment. Frequently, you have the endoscopist, oh, it's finished, okay. Uh, we put band and then it's okay, the, the patient will survive. Not, you must continue the vasoactive uh, treatment because it prevents rebleeding. What about antibiotics? When you, you, you see near half of the patients are infected at the time of uh, variceal bleeding, and uh, there is a, a lot of study, a little bit heterogeneous, but uh, there is a survival benefit to use antibiotics. Uh, I will 
take about which antibiotics, but uh, in terms of, of survival, then you must give this. Um, the thing is that the, the, the also the, the advantage of antibiotics, antibiotics is not only in infected patients. It's also uh, e efficient in non-infected patients. And there is animal study that demonstrate that when you put antibiotics, you reduce bacterial translocation and you reduce the portal pressure. And maybe this is the reason why it is effective. This is the meta-analysis about uh, all the study on, uh, on antibiotics is relatively old, but clearly uh, the treatment seems to be efficacious, uh, efficient, and uh, there is an agreement that you can put ceftriaxone or amoxicillin clavulanate or adapt on local epidemiology and the past history of the patient uh, colonized with MDR and so on. What is the duration of this antibiotic? Even you don't have infection, you must treat the patient for seven days. This is a recommendation. Um, what about the endoscopy? It must be made within 12 hours, but the, low, the level is, of evidence is very low. Um, when you look to the study here, it's a study that excludes patients in shock. Uh, you, have a, you, you see the, the, the criteria here. And in this study, there is no difference in terms of hemostasis, rebleeding or mortality between before and after four hours, before or after eight hours or 12 hours. Then it means that, uh, okay, it's, it's when you have a patient unstable uh, in shock, uh, you must be as soon as possible. But in some situation, you must stabilize the patient and not go through the endoscopy uh, too quickly uh, in an unstable patient because you have, uh, uh, you have complication in this situation. Um, then it's an optimal time after sufficient resuscitation administration of vasoactive drugs. It, demons, it, 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 had, it had been de demonstrated that the treatment with vasoactive treatment uh, can uh, improve uh, the endoscopic treatment due to uh, vision and uh, reducing of, of bleeding. It must be performed by a skilled endoscopist. It demonstrates also that they need an endoscopic nurse and then in good condition and not uh, every time in at night and uh, very quickly. What is the treatment? Uh, uh, it's demonstrated now that uh, ligation is the best option for esophageal varices. There is no more place for sclerotherapy. And when you look to the stomach, uh, there is different uh, gastric varices. I will not go into detail because it's endoscopic stuff, but just to know that it's demonstrated in, in, in the stomach that uh, the, the glue, uh, cyanoacrylate, is better. Uh, it's better due to the fact that uh, here you see uh, the, 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 the results. There is a, a very good hemostasis with this glue. You, you put a needle inside uh, the varices and you fix uh, the varices and the, you stop the bleeding. Uh, and the, the re-bleeding re rates is nearly the same than you, what we observe in bind ligation in esophageal varices. But the thing is that when you compare bind ligation with the glue in the stomach, you see that to stop the bleeding is the same, but the risk of relapse is increased when you use bind ligation due to the fact that you, you, you band not all the viruses, but a part of viruses. And then if the band uh, goes down, okay, you re-bleed. Uh, then uh, you must put glue in this situation. What about preemptive tips? You know this, it's a chain that we put between the hepatic vein and the portal vein inside the liver to decrease the portal pressure. And this study published in New England Journal of Medicine is based on the hypothesis that uh, due to in some subgroup of patients with a very high risk of rebleed, there is a, 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 a benefit to put a TIPS in this subgroup of patients. Here is the patient with Chalpuc C, but less than 14, uh, or childhood B patient with an active bleeding at the endoscopy. And then the patient is randomized, it's a small cohort, but the, the patient is randomized for preemptive tips or standard medical treatment. And as you see here, the, the, the composite endpoint is positive. 
It means that you have less rebleeding and you have higher uh, survival rate in patients with TIPS compared to uh, non-TIPS. And this study is confirmed in a larger uh, cohort that demonstrates there is a, ser a survival benefit. And is in this publication, it seems to be uh, more effective in child PUC c than child PUC b with active bleeding. They don't demonstrate a survival benefit in this subgroup, but clearly in child PUC c uh, there is a benefit. It changed our practice because we are afraid in this patient to put the tips uh, for the risk of hepatic encephalopathy, but as you see here, um, the result is, is relatively good. When you are a failure to control, you are, you are not able to uh, control the bleeding by your endoscopy. Even you give antibiotics, you give vasoactive drugs. There is a place for salvage therapy. There is case series. There is no randomized control trial, but you can put a balloon tamponade. You could use also a Nemo spray. It's a powder developed during the war, and then you, you inject the powder in, in the stomach and then create a uh, um, a wall and stop the bleeding, but it's not a definitive treatment. It's just to, to stabilize the patient and to uh, treat afterwards. Uh, and there is also a place for removal esophageal stent, cover stent. You put, it's only for esophageal varices. Make, you can stop the hemorrhage in this situation. And then if uh, you, uh, you are, uh, you put a balloon tamponade, you must uh, think about further endoscopy tips or surgery. It's surgery is portocaval anastomosis, but it's very rare. Uh, but you need to maybe to transfer to an expert center that have the, all this uh, treatment uh, to, to offer the best option for the patient. To conclude, uh, I will give you this algorithm. You have a patient with a cirrhosis and you have a, an active a varicial bleeding, you, you have the uh, hypothesis because you have hemorrhage, but you don't know if it's peptic oxera or, or a varicial bleeding. Uh, the highest um, risk is for varicial bleeding. Then you, you resuscitate the patient, you consider intubation to perform an endoscopy in, a, in good condition. Uh, you put IV access, blood transfusion to have a goal uh, of seven. You put antibiotics and you put vasoactive drugs. After this, you perform the gastroscopy uh, at least after 12 hours, but maybe before if you have an unstable patient, but in good condition. If you have esophageal varices, you treat by bang ligation. If you have gastric varices, more uh, injection of glue. If you control the breathing, you don't say, okay, it's finished. I treat the patient, it's okay. No, you think about tips. No. In this situation, in child C, um, maybe in child B plus active bleeding at the endoscopy, you, you think about preemptive tips because it's increased survival. If you don't control the bleeding, okay, you put um, a salvage ther therapy by balloon tamponade, emo spray or stent, and you think about transfer or Reaper from the endoscopy in a good condition with a more skilled endoscopist. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes. safe or is it dangerous? No. no. Then um, I look at that because we have always this discussion. The, the thing is that the trigger for a varicial hemorrhage is never a lesion on the mucosa, but an increase in portal pressure. Then when you put a small tube in the stomach, there is no risk of bleeding. There is a court published by Mayo Clinic that demonstrates that if the patient has varices or not, when you put uh, uh, the gastric tube, there is no more bleeding event or so on and so on. Then um, it's not dangerous to put, when, when you have 
you don't know and you want to know if there is blood in, in the stomach, you can put it. There is no problem at all. Sometimes, also, when I perform um, bind ligation, but in very stressful situation with large hemorrhage, I put a tube after my bind ligation, okay, to look at the re-bleeding, because it's always difficult to define re-bleeding in this such sick patient. Then, for me, it's not a problem uh, at all. And also, when you, you, you bind ligate a patient, and two days after, you think, okay, maybe we can... When you know you perform a lot of bind ligation, a, a small tube never uh, create a problem with a band because we pass an endoscope more larger than, than the tube. And for me, it's not a problem. Thank you. We will have a few more minutes after our third speaker for additional questions if our panelists are finished. Thank you. I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Javier Fernandez from Barcelona, Spain, to talk to us about the management of sepsis in patients with liver failure. Good morning. So, my talk will be about uh, management of sepsis, but in acute oncologic liver failure, not in acute liver failure, because we have enough data to, to describe this, this problem, and not enough in, in acute liver failure. So, this, are, this is my, my disclosure. As you know, uh, bacterial infection is a quite prevalent, a very prevalent uh, problem in, in patients with cirrhosis, with acute decompensation, and with acute and chronic liver failure. And this is because there are many, many causes that contribute to the de development of these infections. Uh, cirrhosis associated immune dysfunction, uh, problems of uh, barrier, barrier failure, alterations in the microbiota, clinical factors, and in some cases, 10% more or less genetic factors. So they are highly predisposed to the development of, of bacterial infections. This, uh, this is demonstrated in this slide. This shows the prevalence of bacterial infections in ACLF and in acute decomposition in two series, two prospective series, including more than 1,000 patients, canonic and predict. And you can see that in ACLF patients, uh, we move from 38% to 50% of, uh, of prevalence of infections, and in uh, acute decompensation between 25 to 29. So it's a huge prevalence of, of, of infection. And the higher the grade of, uh, of the of ACLF, the higher the prevalence of infection, reaching more than 50% in cases with ACLF grade 3. Moreover, uh, these patients, patients with ACLF, demonstrate a high susceptibility to develop uh, infections at short term. You can see in this, in this graph the probability of developing infections during hospitalization at, during the next four weeks in patients with ACLF in red and in patients with AD in green. And you can see that this probability reaches almost 60% in patients with ACLF compared to just 20% in patients with acute decompensation. Moreover, bacterial infections complicate the evolution of patients with cirrhosis and with ACLF. These, these bacterial infections, pneumonia, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, bacteremia, uh, trigger an intense in, uh, systemic inflammatory response that causes tissue damage, with mitochondrial dysfunction, immunopathology that contributes to the development of ACLF or to uh, worsen the, 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 the clinical status of patients with ACLF, causing kidney failure, vascular failure, shock. Our patients are more prone to, de to develop uh, septic shock, liver failure, brain failure, adrenal uh, insufficiency, coagulation failure, and uh, respiratory failure. In this, uh, in this study, performed is, is an international ascites club uh, uh, survey. Uh, they uh, evaluated the prevalence of ACLF in patients with infection, more than 1,300 1, patients. And you can see that it's more frequent that the patient present with ACLF than with just acute decompensation. So, uh, bacterial infection is extremely frequent in patients with uh, ACLF as a trigger or as a complication. And in this uh, study, the authors look for uh, independent predictors of ACLF development in patients with, with uh, bacterial infections. 
and uh, there are uh, several, including uh, factors associated with liver dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, or, or melt. But please look at the, at the type of, of infection: spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and pneumonia were identified as the main infections causing <coughs> ACLF. And also, very importantly, the, uh, if you administer inadequate uh, antibiotic therapy, the, the, the probability of, of uh, causing uh, ACLF of, uh, is, is uh, significantly higher. So please think in uh, adequate empirical antibiotic therapy when you are treating your, these ACLF patients. It's the same to be infected or not in patients with ACLF or with AD. Uh, you can see in this graph uh, derived from the canonic study that is not the same. In green, you have the patients with AD and the probability of survival in infected and non-infected patients. There is no difference, but the difference is made basically in patients with, with ACLF, logically, in patients with severe, uh, a severe clinical picture. Patients in blue with uh, no infections, either as precipitating event or as a complication, so with better survival than those patients who uh, develop an infection as a precipitating event or as a complication. So it's a prevalent problem, and uh, we should try to identify, to diagnose early this, this infection in this cohort, in these patients with, with uh, ketone chronic liver failure. You should perform a complete physical examination looking for signs of, uh, of uh, infection, for example, uh, abdominal findings such as abdominal pain, tenderness, looking for, for signs of uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or even secondary peritonitis. But we also should perform, should perform a, a, a complete workup for, in, for infection, including what is classical blood count cultures, independently of the patient, if, if the patient is with fever or not, check X-ray, a CT and pleural fluid uh, cell count assessment and cultures, urinary sediment and culture, gram stain and of a sputum and culture, and uh, consider abdominal ultra ultrasonography if you don't have enough uh, ascites to perform the tap. And in my experience in the ICU, you should, you should I suppose you, you perform epidemiological surveillance, you should also perform rectal and nasal swabs in order to know uh, if your patient is colonized by multiple resident bacteria. And in parallel, you should assess uh, possible organ failures, uh, lactate levels, uh, renal uh, parameters such as creatinine, electrolytes, whatever, ascites, encephalopathy, serum bilirubin to assess liver function, coagulation, and so on. And uh, we should ask for uh, classical microbiological tests, but ideally in patients with, who are quite severe for rapid tests in order to identify very rapidly the, the bacteria responsible for infection. As uh, we have said, is the, 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 these patients are very, very prone to develop infection and also to develop uh, antibiotic resistant uh, infections. Uh, you know which are the, the main multilateral resistant bacteria. You, you also know, I suppose, that the, the ecology of, of, uh, of uh, these infections varies between centers, between countries. And you also must know which are the, ma the major risk factors of antibiotic resistance. In the presence of these risk factors, you should start uh, broad spectrum antibiotics in the setting of uh, patients with ACLF. Nosocomial episode, recent hospitalization within the, the previous three months, recent systemic antibiotic exposure, recent invasive procedures, ICU admission, and recent infection or colonization by multiple resistant bacteria. Which is the impact of uh, on survival or, or receiving inadequate empirical antibiotic strategies? This is the same in the general population, but is more relevant, I think, in cirrhosis. You can see in the graph of the, of the left the risk of, of development of ACLF in patients with AD receiving inadequate antibiotic therapy is significantly higher, and the mortality is also higher in AD or in ACLF if you uh, administer in, uh, inadequate empirical antibiotic strategies. Currently recommended empirical antibiotic therapy in patients with cirrhosis, AD or ACLF, divide the, the, the strategies between community acquired infections and nosocomial healthcare associated infections, and suggest to, to administer broad spectrum antibiotics uh, 
depending on the area, Piperacillin Tazobactam, Meropenem, or Meropenem Plus, uh, a coverage for gram-positive cocci, glycopeptide, for example, uh, in patients with, with uh, health, healthcare-related infections. The other point is not just the type of, of antibiotic that you use, uh, is, but, but the, the time uh, in which these antibiotics are administered. This concept comes from, from the ICU world. This is the golden hour concept, and it's, it has been also demonstrated in cirrhotic patients with septic shock. The study included more than 200 patients with, with septic shock and demonstrated the, that the, 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 it is very, very important to administer this antibiotic very early. Its hour of delay is increasing mortality 8%. And this uh, is true for all the kind of, of uh, analysis that you, you want to do on, on, on the, as you can see on the, on the right. So adequate antibiotic therapy and early. And this uh, concept that uh, the impact of uh, the negative uh, impact of the delay of uh, the administration of, of adequate antibiotic therapy has also been demonstrated in septic shock caused by spontaneous bacteria peritonitis. You can see in the graph of the, of the left, the higher the delay, the higher the hospital mortality, and especially in patients uh, with uh, a severe picture with a patch as a score of 40 or, or 30. This, the impact of locally tailored empirical antibiotic therapy has been demonstrated, for example, in this, in this study, evaluating nosocomial SVP. The authors randomized the patients to receive cefepime or the combination of, of meropenem daptomycin. Uh, this is uh, adjusted to the local epidemiology, ESBL enterobacteria and vancomycin resistant enterobacteria. And you can see the evolution of the patient uh, and the resolution infection, uh, of, the, of the infection was significantly higher in patients receiving Yes, schemes tailored according to the local epidemiology. The, pro the, the, the problem of, of, uh, of uh, multidrug resistant bacteria in cirrhosis and in the general population requires solutions. One of these solutions could be rapid microbiological tests, epidemiological surveillance, as we will see later, Infect infection control practices in the ICU, high hygiene, and uh, barrier precautions, and the use of bundles to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia and catheter-associated infections, for sure antibiotic stewardship programs, and a new, uh, the use of new uh, antibiotics and new uh, dosing strategies, as we will see later. What we do now in, in our ICUs in the hospital clinic in Barcelona is the following. We do not consider if the infection is uh, community acquired or nosocomial in the setting of a septic shock. If a patient has a septic shock, we move, we administer broad spectrum antibiotics at high doses, and if it, uh, the patient has no septic shock, we consider the presence of uh, uh, risk factors for antibiotic resistance, and in the absence of these uh, risk factors, we administer classical uh, beta-lactams. After two, uh, three days, we reevaluate the, the, these schemes and consider the, the microbiological results adjust to the, to the microbiological results, if possible, in monotherapy, and in, in the setting of negative cultures, we consider the isolation of multidrug resistant bacteria in rectal or nasal swabs, relying uh, the descalation de of the antibiotic uh, strategies in the presence or absence of these uh, multidrug resistant bacteria. And very importantly, we limit the duration of the, of the treatment to five days if no, there is no source of infection, and to seven days in the rest of infections. These are the, the doses that we use uh, in the first two days of, of the, the infections, uh, the normal doses, but later on, uh, for example, you see meropenem, we use six grams per day in continuous infusion, the same for ceftafidim, six grams per day in continuous infusion in order to uh, reach high concentration of the antibiotic in the source of infection. This is, these are uh, dynamic uh, slides that try to explain what, what, uh, uh, what important is to, to administer the high doses in the first hours and in continuous infusion. Imagine you have an ammonia caused by, by susceptible bacteria, but that you have a population of resistant bacteria with a mix of uh, eight. You will need uh, antibiotic concentration over eight, around 10, to uh, eliminate the susceptible and the resistant bacteria. 
So at the beginning, you have the effect of in inoculum effect, the saturation of the, the activity of the leukocytes, and the presence of this uh, resistant bacteria. So during the first 24, 48 hours, you need uh, to reach these high concentrations in the source of infection, and this can be only obtained if you administer boluses, for example, two grams of meropenem, followed by a high doses in continuous infusion, and later on, you can escalate to, to you can normalize the, the, the doses of the antibiotics and to stop the treatment. Um, sorry. There are some evidences in the, in the literature uh, suggested that the, the use of extended intravenous infusion for beta-lactams has an impact on, on, the clinic, on, on patients with cirrhosis. This uh, was demonstrated. You can see that the survival of patients receiving continuous infusion was significantly better than those receiving classical approaches. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to remark that uh, to me, the, the, the results of epidemiological surveillance is, is, are important. We published this paper recently in the Journal of Pathology. We demonstrated that uh, the prevalence of, of uh, colonization is very high in Barcelona, 42%, but also in another court in, in Germany, 47%. The, that the predominant colonizing uh, strain was different. In Barcelona was ESBL, but in, in Germany, vancomycin resistant enterobacteria. But what it was most important, more, more important was that uh, the, the, there is a high risk of infection by the colonizing bacteria if, uh, at short term. And this was confirmed in both, in both series. So, what is, is quite difficult to, be, to, become colonized, to become infected by a multidrug resistant bacteria if you are not colonized by, by this bacteria. We will go through this because we don't have time. So the take home messages are that bacterial infections frequently precipitate or complicate AD, but mainly acute and chronic liver failure, increasing mortality that if, uh, since it is uh, clinically relevant, we need to perform a complete workup for infection when you are facing uh, a patient with HLF, that you should adapt uh, in a severe, severe patient your antibiotic strategies to the local epidemiology. Uh, this antibiotic should be started as soon as possible after performing cultures. These strategies in patients with uh, in intensive care should be uh, optimized uh, through the administration of continuous infusion of beta laxams, for example. For for sure, we should escalate rapidly these these strategies and to use short-term treatments, five to seven days. Uh, we have not commented these uh, fungal infections are not so very frequent, uh, normally complicate ACLF. And this, you should think on, on these infections in patients with uh, septic shock during, who are admitted in the ICU for a long period of, of time. And as you perform in the general population, you should uh, perform also uh, bundles to prevent catheter-associated infection and medulloblastic-associated pneumonia. Uh, regarding solution fluids, uh, we will not comment. There is no, no, no clear... Uh, answer for this and uh, I think it's, that's all because we have not commented this. Thank you very much. The floor is now open for any questions to Dr. Fernandez. Yes? Just wait for the microphone, please. Sorry. Hello, uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. I'm an ID physician, Maya Hitesh from Erasmus Hospital. So I was just curious, uh, you well described that if you have a very severe patient in septic shock, that you need to give a, a large spectrum, a broad spectrum antibiotics. What happens? And then you have to de-escalate as soon as you can. What do you do with your patients that you end up with no uh, all of your microbiological sampling comes back negative and your patient is not improving, what do you do? Do you further escalate or do you, how do you go about it? Do, do you consider uh, also the microbiology of the uh, surveillance as WOPs? 
Yes, so let's just say that everything's negative. Everything is negative. <laughs> if the patient, we, we try to uh, short the duration of the of the treatment, but, but maybe if we don't have, if we don't have uh, data of uh, of uh, colonization by multidrug resistant bacteria, we escalate, for example, to third generation of cephalosporins. The key is, if there is no multidrug resistant bacteria, there is no need for giving meropenem plus uh, take-up planning. We move, remove these antibiotics and move to piperacillin, tazobactam, or depending on the type of infection, or maybe third reaction. Okay, thank you. And I just have one second question, because you talked about giving uh, your meropenem in continuous infusion. Just uh, wondering, do you do monitoring of your drugs in your hospital, or, or is this empirical? No, no, it's, we are monitoring uh, the, the results of, of this policy, and what I have to say is that we have not seen an increase in, in the rate of multidrug resistant bacteria uh, since the application of this uh, antibiotic policy. Okay, no, no, I meant you, do you monitor the uh, concentrations of your... No, yeah, the, 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 for example, for meropenem, yes, for... for uh, we don't use am amicacin, we don't use vancomycin, but for meropenem, for example, yes. And, I have a quick question related to any role for biomarkers for detecting infection. I find that we always give empiric antibiotics, sometimes very broad antibiotics, and I'm always concerned that these patients are already kind of immune compromised and the risk of MDRO is very high. Do you, and microbiologic cultures, you know, they take time. Do you, do you at least use any biomarker like procalcitonin or do something to detect infection highly in these patients? No, we use uh, the two biomarkers that you, you have also in uh, PCR and procalcitonin. But personally, I relate more in, in PCR than in procalcitonin. Uh, you have to adjust your levels considering the, the degree of liver dysfunction of a patient. A child puxy patient is going to have high but quite low uh, levels of PCR. For example, five milligrams per deciliter in a, in a severe infection. Uh, and you don't, you don't have to think that this is not relevant because you know, the synthesis of this biomarker is performed only in, liver, in the liver. Procalcitonin, we have some data that uh, indicate that this is not superior to, to uh, PCR in the diagnosis. Maybe it's superior as occurs in, in the general population in the escalation, in to, to, guide, to the guide the uh, escalation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had another question. I didn't seem to hear about N-acetylcysteine <laughs> in a so. non-acetaminophen liver failure. Can maybe Dr. Weldon or somebody comment on that? Uh, is that is that still in fashion, or is that something that we should not be considering? No, we we use. Uh, I don't know in in in, uh, in patients with non uh, paracetamol. Uh, Fulmin and hepatic failure with low rates of hepatic encephalopathy, grade one or two. There are one. There is one uh, study indicating that it improves survival. It's quite cheap. Uh, a drug without uh, side effects, and uh, we use not only in paracetamol but in non-paracetamol. Uh, yes, one more question in the back. Thank you. Um, SLF patients op often have both uh, acute uh, alcoholic hepatitis and infections. In this setting, do you use corticosteroids for the HAA? Uh, depend on the infection and depend on the degree of, of, the, of the severity of infection. In a patient with a septic shock node, in a patient with just a mild infection such as a urinary tract infection, I use. Pneumonia, maybe not. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice talk. So the next speaker, the next speaker is uh, Stefan Mitzner uh, from Rostock in Germany, um, who's going to talk about extracorporeal liver support. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, happy to review extracorporeal liver support to be with you. And uh, this is lovely Rostock, where I come from. It's in the north of Germany at the Baltic Sea coast. Come and see us and my disclosures. And there's more disclosures. One of these systems I'm talking about, I was one of the co-inventors with my dear friend Jan Stange. But that was many, many years ago, and there's no any financial or, or whatsoever involvement, uh, more emotional. Um, 
And liver support, that's a, that's a long-going story, actually, and uh, there's reports as early as in the late 50s where people try to make use of, uh, of healthy animal livers uh, to, to help liver failure patients, as you can see here. Uh, but this was one of the approaches, as many, many would follow, you know, that, that didn't really make it into, into the guidelines. And uh, just to mention that, these approaches were done earlier as there was this urgent need than, than we had access to liver transplantation. As you all know, the, the, the first was done 1967 by Tom Starzl in Denver. Well, many would follow actually, and my most beloved, I, I would like to show you, is a, is a bioreactor uh, from Germany, from Berlin, was then invented by this young gentleman, Jörg Gerlach, surgeon in Berlin, here with his boss, uh, uh, Peter Neuhaus, famous uh, transplant surgeon in Germany at that time. And you see this, uh, his bioreactor where the liver cells were in, and then on the right side, you see how this was implemented in the clinical setting. And the beauty was uh, this spaceship-like, uh, you know, uh, uh, structure of this device. And then inside it has a, a, a really elaborated three-dimensional interwoven hollow fiber uh, uh, setting uh, where you had uh, hollow fibers to, to go from right to left and then up to down. And so we had a, a, a real um, a, a setting where all the liver cells e eventually they filled in that were human hepatocytes were in between the hollow fibers and so you had lines t for the blood to go, for oxygen to go and there was space for bile as well. But still, it's another one that didn't make it. Um, so today, if you ask me, uh, uh, I think we need to talk uh, about uh, plasma exchange. Um, albumin dialysis in its different flavors and uh, adsorptive devices. Looking at the setting that, that as we see it today, how liver support is supposed to help is uh, that obviously we need a patient with liver problem, uh, best medical care, and then consider liver support therapy as an add-on to improve neurological status, hemodynamics uh, and biologics in order to bridge the patient to successful transplantation or hope for recovery. One point that I think killed many systems is that we did not have a clear plan on what acute and chronic liver failure is. You know? So there are obviously uh, the, the relatively recent work from hepatologists all over the world, mainly Europe, um, about the ACLF uh, grading is extremely helpful and you're aware of that, that uh, with increasing numbers of organ failures uh, that we have increasing numbers of uh, mortalities to be expected. So, but we didn't know all of that uh, uh, the years before. So start with plasma exchange and then uh, there's this landmark trial uh, from, from Europe from uh, uh, Finstolz Larsen, Will Bernard, ist dabei, uh, Christa Hackerstedt, uh, Julia Wenden, we heard this morning, and they had high volume uh, plasma exchange done. Quite tedious approach with uh, uh, three days treatment, eight to 12 liters of plasma being exchanged per day, you know, so that was, uh, but worth it in a way as they uh, had a significant um, increase in, in total survival and that was mainly driven by uh, the transplant-free survival. So if you have a patient where you're not sure, uh, you get a liver in, uh, uh, plasma exchange might, might help that patient. Plus, a lot of uh, very detailed thorough analysis was done and gave, among others, uh, a good picture on the immunological side, you know, the infectious side uh, that goes along with acute liver failure. Uh, as you can see here with all the cytokines that were followed uh, during the course. So that really is probably my most beloved uh, liver support uh, trial as it uh, was well done and gave a good result. Can we use plasma exchange for acute on chronic liver failure? Yes, maybe. You know, a lot of data uh, accumulating the same problem that it was indifferent, the results for ACLF. But now, you know, with the advent of the ACLF grading, we see uh, a clearer picture, as is in this, uh, in, in this analysis. Uh, 
Uh, you see what they had is 1,100 uh, patients uh, evaluated uh, and 800 had ACLF and 280 had, had just decompensation with organ, without organ failure and they found 93 that had uh, plasma exchange on top of standard medical care and uh, then there, this is uh, total survival and you see it, it, it has no effect on 90 day survival, but there's this window opening in between. So short term survival, 28 day survival is better. Uh, if you just look at the AD group, so no organ failure, there's no need to do this treatment, you know, because they will survive anyway, or at least you cannot help them with plasma exchange. In, ACL, in the ACLF uh, group, yes, there, there, there was this signal on the 28 day um, level. And this was mainly here, they had ACLF grade one, two, and three, uh, you see, and this is um, ma uh, mainly driven by ACLF two and three. Uh, there, this is uh, where the effect sits. So, go on, albumin dialysis. Uh, well, well, this is the role model for the albumin dialysis, the Mars system, and the idea is obviously to remove whatever sits on top of al the albumin molecule, and this is bilirubin, bile acids, and many other stuff, in order to uh, take that burden from the liver and make the patients wake up again. Um, and there's uh, nowadays a, a, a number of uh, uh, variants of the albumin dialysis is spat, the open albumin dialysis, it's the adverse system. And if you want so, the, the Prometheus system is an albumin cleansing uh, approach as well. So the evidence, I, I stopped counting 2017, obviously, but I will focus on, because I know this best, but there's uh, most data were accumulated in this field for the Mars system. So is there, can you use that in acute liver failure? Probably the answer is yes. Uh, there are studies from Europe, especially from France, uh, the FULMAR trial, that was, that was suggestive for a, a significantly prolonged uh, uh, transplant-free survival, you know, so otherwise the, 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 the trial was negative. And the same was found in the U.S. Uh, re quite recently uh, by the U.S. Acute Liver Failure Study Group. And they did a propensity score matching one to four and had 104 patients being all ALF uh, on Mars uh, versus then 460 controls. And they found uh, significantly uh, prolonged uh, medium term 20, 21 day transplant fee survival uh, again. Oops, no, this one. So probably you can do that to, to uh, bridge patients that don't make it to uh, transplantation. Can you use Mars in acute and chronic liver failure? Well, not in all is the answer. You know, we had like this, the, the largest ever Mars trial was the relief trial, and uh, that was a negative trial. You know, if you pull them all together, but there is again, as with the plasma exchange and ACLF, it's uh, if, you, if you then go uh, into reanalysis and look at the ACLF grades. It's a similar picture that it's no good to, to treat ACLF grade one or AD because, well, there's, there, there's no difference to be achieved. But if the patients get sicker, like ACLF grade two or three, uh, then a window opens at least on the 28 day uh, niveau. And another message that later came out is the intensity of treatment should be high enough. Uh, so this was a reanalysis of this relief trial. Uh, you see this, we saw this before, there was no difference in the overall group. But if you do intense treatments, and this means at least four treatments per patient, uh, then we see a, uh, a survival difference that even was uh, significant. Uh, we should maybe study that in the future. What is the idea of, uh, well, experts uh, in 2022 uh, with regard to uh, albumin dialysis? It's, uh, uh, see, it's, it's here on the, on the right, it says, yes, we see studies that show beneficial effect on hepatic encephalopathy, refractory pruritus, renal function, reduction of cholestasis and jaundice. But we should uh, keep this or spare this technique for patients with a transplant project. So uh, 
for those that are listed for transmutation, in other words. Adsorptive techniques, that's a, that's a more a, a younger uh, type of techniques and there's uh, still a lot of hope maybe going with that, but we don't really have the data, but I show you what we have. The hypothesis is good. Uh, we see uh, in acute liver failure and in a second you see ACLF that there's a massive immune disturbance, you know, with uh, high cytokines going along with that uh, and that being correlated with worse outcome. So, and then, so there probably came the idea to use uh, cytokine adsorption in this uh, setting. Here you see the same uh, role of cytokines, uh, impact on outcome for ACLF, uh, IL-6, IL IL-10, uh, make a difference with regard to survival. And notably, the cutoff levels are not like 5,000, like in sepsis we might have, or 500. It's, it's much lower levels, you know, so interestingly uh, here uh, still makes a difference. High IL-6 uh, and high IL-10 go along with a worse outcome. So there probably came the idea to, to make use of, uh, of, of cytokine adsorption. This is a case from, from, from our center. We had acute liver failure, uh, hemophagocytotic syndrome uh, in herpes uh, simplex virus infection. We bridged uh, with Mars, a uh, patient was listed for transplantation but deteriorated, uh, norepinephrine level went uh, up and uh, we measured IL-6, there was 80,000 in that patient, so that was then the moment when we switched to use a cytosorb, a cytokine adsorbent plus a uh, single pass albumin dialysis and we felt yes that in the days uh, to follow the, uh, uh, the patient stabilized and was then successfully transplanted. And others had done single cases like this one where you see in chronic patients if you do repeated uh, adsorbent treatments that bilirubin goes down and uh, IL-6 goes down and uh, uh, the ammonia level uh, leveled down as well. So is there any evidence? Well, yes, it's building. So, so there is a, a, a fairly large uh, cytosol registry with more than 1,000 patients, and there's a subset uh, where it was used in for, for various types of uh, hepatic insuffi uh, insufficiency. And uh, what the registry reports is that, yes, you can reduce bilirubin, and others, other support systems have started like that. And then there's no control group but survival was better than the scores uh, had uh, suggested. So there's hope for future trials. Well, and this is if we pool now all the, the evidence, you know, and, and you can question whether that's a good idea to do, but uh, people did that. Uh, so for, for acute liver failure and ACLF and all the randomized trials that they could find, and this is a review from 2019, uh, and had evaluated and some, some, oops, go back, had evaluated some uh, 25 randomized trials in 1,800 patients. And um, this is what they found. It's survival in the top and it's hepatic encephalopathy uh, down. And what we see there, there seems to be, there is a signal, you know, for uh, improved survival that was significant and improved hepatic encephalopathy uh, if you pull these all together. However, the, the, the level or the grade of certainty, the quality of data is uh, best case uh, moderate to low and that definitely is a problem of the field that we need better trials. Um, Still, the take-home message uh, was uh, these colleagues' use of extracorporeal liver support devices with both ALF and ACLF may improve mortality, hepatic encephalopathy, but we need more data. And uh, brings me to my conclusions. Uh, plasma exchange, albumin dialysis, hemoadsorptions are available. That's good. You know, hemoadsorption pretty easy uh, to use. Uh, that's an advantage. Level of evidence is quite good. You know, the best for plasma exchange, then for Mars, uh, and then for hemoadsorption. ALF, what you, you might expect is improved uh, transplant free survival, ACLF. Encephalopathy, yes, patients wake up if you do that. 
uh, you can stabilize kidney function, hemodynamics, and probably short-term survival, uh, but a lot of work to do, patient selection, dosing, timing, we have no idea, probably early start might make sense, and this will drive outcome. And clinical evidence is moderate, or low certainty, but building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it was very clear. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you so much. Um, if there was a way to design a, the optimal ideal trial for extracorporeal liver support, um, how would you design it in a way that you can actually affect, you know, a significant outcome result? Well, thank you for that, that, that excellent question. Uh, I think we should do acute liver failure and focus on those that don't get an organ, you know, because there is, a, I think, a clear signal and there might be room for that, you need. And there's countries where you don't have access to, to like in France, where they transplanted everyone within 24 hours yeah, from listing. Uh, and uh, so I would do that probably. And in the, in the chronic field, my most beloved would be acute, uh, it would be hepatorenal syndrome to compare it to standard renal replacement therapy because that is really a bad thing to do, you know, and I, I would always urge that if you start to dialyze someone with ACLF, uh, hepatorenal syndrome type 1, then really consider, uh, uh, instead of standard dialysis, consider one of the, the other methods, because that will probably give a survival advantage. Great, thank you so much. We're going to move on to our last speaker. Uh, Dr. William Bernal from King's College in London. And he's going to talk to us about when treatment for liver failure becomes futile. Sorry, we're a bit confused. We have different speakers. Okay. We're just looking at our script, but it's fine. We have uh, Dr. Claudio Ronco. Instead, doing extracorporeal devices, future <laughs> options. Dr. Ronco. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think it's instead, but it's rather probably one after the other. There was a little mess in the program. There was a mess in the online program. So myself, I had to prepare in a hurry this speech, so I apologize. No, no worries, Dr. Ronco. We're delighted to hear you. Anyway, uh, I was glad that uh, Stefan Mitzner has given most of my talk and uh, uh, I don't have too much to say except uh, that I will try to uh, expand a little bit on the pathophysiology. Uh, we have experienced that in patients uh, with acute kidney injury and liver failure, the outcome has always been terrible and hemodynamics is terrible. So that's why extracorporeal therapy is looking also into the possibility to remove bile acids who have a specific hepatotoxicity and uh, may lead to uh, a series of events, including activation of caspase and Bax protein, one of the BCL2 family proteins towards apoposis of cells and indeed aggravate hepatotoxicity. The same is true for the kidney that, uh, as you know, may indeed suffer significantly at the tubular level for the presence of uh, uh, bile acids. And finally, we have hyperammonemia, which is an important aspect to be considered, especially in light of the interaction between brain, kidney, and the liver. So this uh, component uh, of the metabolism is especially interesting in uh, neonates and in the pediatric population because of the possibility to induce a significant level 
of uh, uh, brain swelling. And uh, I think we were among the first who demonstrated the difference between continuous and intermittent renal replacement therapy in creating uh, uh, different levels of effects at the brain uh, uh, level. In fact, uh, intermittent type of therapies may induce uh, a fall in serum osmolality, which in turn uh, um, somehow activates an osmotic uh, uh, call of water inside the brain tissue uh, increasing the intracranial pressure and this is one of the very first typical uh, um, evidence-based indications for continuous therapies indeed because the problem of brain perfusion is uh, in some of these patients uh, clearly induced by a congestion uh, and the resistance of the venous return due to increase in pressure at the tissue level. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, Shita Tolvani uh, published uh, this paper saying uh, concerning the uh, uh, hyperammonemia, I think that uh, this is probably one of the very important indications for high volume CRRT and the uh, diffusive phase in the early beginning uh, uh, may lead to significant removal of uh, this uh, toxic substance. So uh, improving the diffusive removal of ammonium uh, uh, may, can make a difference uh, in uh, this type of patients. Uh, as uh, Stefan has mentioned recently, we were intrigued by the possibility of having new type of uh, uh, sorbent devices uh, that may indeed help, but uh, certainly we need more research uh, uh, for the uh, future. Certainly, it might be the new frontier because of the effect of the previous liver support system have demonstrated to be not really satisfactory and new devices and new materials may allow us uh, to possibly also add uh, uh, selective removal to different uh, uh, substances and uh, we have described different uh, new devices recently. But if we look at the history uh, of sorbents in this area, we may see that uh, CPFA was uh, uh, one of the first options that were uh, proposed uh, in which plasma is separated from blood, circulated through a, a sorbent which has a very, very, very thin uh, uh, composition and for this reason has very high resistance in most of the cases. You cannot really uh, have a flow higher than 15, 20 mLs per minute in practice and the cartridge is small, gets saturated very early and uh, the, the layout uh, is a little bit uh, uh, complicated. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it has been used and uh, it is today probably almost uh, abandoned because of the high resistance of this sorbent component that uh, really uh, you know, the flow inside these cartridges depend on the diameter of the beads, the tortuous path, uh, several other variables, and in this case the resistance was really too high. Nevertheless, uh, it showed some efficiency in removing bilirubin, but you see saturation was occurring in less than four hours, so uh, different type of treatments, uh, repeated treatments should be uh, probably done. Uh, Mars, uh, uh, Stefan has alluded to, and uh, uh, really it is based on a double concept, uh, the use of albumin as a carrier and the use of a sorbent in a specific uh, uh, double circuit uh, that uh, is uh, somehow uh, combined uh, with uh, uh, CRT and uh, specific CRT machines uh, in order to carry uh, uh, through the, uh, the membrane uh, uh, bilirubin and uh, bile acids. One of the issues about this thing is the volume of plasma uh, treated at the end and again the saturation of the system that may occur quite uh, uh, rapidly. The other issue is the combination with the CRT machine that uh, uh, the company, for example, has not proposed this in combination with the new machine. Of, uh, so the idea is that they may want to discontinue this uh, uh, project. Another project that has been discontinued is uh, another project coming from Germany, 
and this is uh, uh, the Prometheus system we have used in our department. Again, it's based on a plasma filtration membrane on the albumin circulation uh, 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 parallel to the uh, classic dialysis membrane. And uh, the efficiency was again questionable because of the rapid saturation of the system. Here is the uh, there is a kind of pathophysiological rationale for all these treatments, but nevertheless, uh, the practical realization seems to have limitations. And uh, I think that uh, we are somehow um, facing the fact that companies seem to be disappointed and then they may leave uh, these projects uh, uh, not to evolve into it. Uh, plasma filtration absorption, however, has gathered a lot of interest because of the capacity to remove uh, to remove bilirubin uh, uh, with uh, uh, cartridges that can be bigger and can process uh, higher volumes of uh, plasma up to 30 ml per minute which makes it uh, really uh, competitive with uh, uh, plasma exchange and uh, even overcoming the uh, volume single pass album in dialysis was a good idea but uh, at least in our hands it didn't work at all it costed a lot and uh, we tested this we tested also in neonates uh, uh, but honestly there was no significant uh, uh, effect as expected by the original proposal of having these particles carrying uh, uh, bilirubin to a higher level compared to any type of uh, uh, process so there were comparison studies but the level of reduction was uh, uh, still questionable. We have recently adopted a new system which is a, a double uh, plasma molecular absorption system and as Stefan has mentioned there is this double component uh, in acute liver failure which is one the toxicity of bilirubin, bile acids and ammonia and on the other the evidence or presence of uh, inflammatory mediators. So the idea possibly to combine uh, a removal of toxic substances and the removal of uh, um, let's say uh, 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 mediators uh, of inflammation makes uh, uh, the idea to use uh, the plasma circuit uh, to apply two different types of sorbents, one dedicated to bilirubin, the other dedicated to uh, 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 pro-inflammatory mediators. And here is how the system basically works, uh, and uh, it works uh, significantly well. We tested the, the capacity of removal of bilirubin in vitro. This is an experimental machine in our laboratory, and we use different type of uh, uh, cartridges, and you see the amount of bilirubin that is removed. We started from very, very high concentration. You see the color of the of the bottle at the beginning, and uh, we created a kind of an isotherm for uh, uh, bilirubin, which has never been done before, and allow us uh, to understand when is the moment to change the cartridge because of saturation before we use, based on the initial concentration in plasma of the patient. So the porosity of beads can actually be regulated by different industrial chemistry process and the pore size determines the removal range of the different molecules. The addition of the typical cytokine absorbing system allows to remove several of these mediators that are normally not removed by classic dialysis membrane. That's why the combination of CRRT plus uh, plasma filtration absorption seems to be different and less efficient compared to the double plasma filtration absorption. And this is how it is uh, uh, applied in a, in a Prisma machine. This is the uh, pediatric set of with the smaller cartridges. <clears throat> And there is also dedicated uh, hardware eventually to do this uh, type of therapy. Uh, there was uh, uh, initial evidence of the uh, uh, more efficient uh, uh, activity in terms of removal of mediators and bilirubin of DP mass versus plasma phrase. But as Stefan has mentioned, uh, 
evidence is building and there are studies ongoing. In particular, there is a, a small meta-analysis comparing DP mass with plasma exchange, um, showing that uh, uh, the addition of the removal of mediators seems to have an important effect. But there is an interesting study that will be probably published soon that I'm aware that uh, has been done in more than 1,000 patients. So this is a very, very interesting thing. I'd like to conclude telling that uh, <clears throat> when you don't know something, the best answer is go on with research. And uh, exactly <clears throat> from tomorrow night in San Diego, we will have uh, one of the sessions of the Acute Disease Quality Initiative together with the International Club of Scientists, where we want to uh, somehow uh, study the problem of kidney dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis and uh, the problem of artificial liver support. This is the program and the faculty and the main uh, uh, objectives are to identify key questions, to clarify points of consensus and controversy, especially for future studies, assessing the available evidence and identify areas where evidence is lacking, having plenary sessions to present the evidence and the iterative refining of recommendation. I remind you that this is not a guideline uh, process, it's just uh, a kind of uh, research agenda implementation. Design a research agenda, in fact, at several levels, conceptual, pragmatic, and individual study design, and then draft summary and having external peer review for the publication. And we have different groups. One will take care of epidemiology and definition, the other of pathophysiology and risk factors, the other work up on prevention, management of kidney dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis and follow up and rehabilitation. I think that uh, we cannot in our ICU patient uh, consider acute liver failure as a separate entity. Most of the time, this is combined with infection and sepsis, with the cytokine release syndrome, and with acute kidney injury. And the so-called hepatorenal syndrome is one of the areas where we have not been particularly effective so far. So we need actually to develop a strategy for these patients. Thank you, and sorry for the mess of the program. It was not my fault. <laughs> The floor is open for any questions to Dr. Ronco. Yes, if you could just wait on the microphone for a second. So you can speak louder. Okay. Dr. Ronco, I would like to ask you something. You just talked about the problem that sometimes these patients have the septic shock and the importance of, and the other lecture, the importance of the antibiotic therapy and the thorough antibiotic therapy. And the question is, uh, if you have any information on what this system can do to the antibiotic plasmatic concentration and uh, what should be our worries about that and how we should address that, that issue? Yeah, this is a very important uh, question because uh, uh, we do not have uh, intelligent uh, sorbent device, so we also remove uh, substances like antibiotics. We did studies and we have shown that uh, we can saturate uh, the uh, uh, sorbent quite rapidly for uh, uh, antibiotics, so we have two different approaches. One is to deliver an increased dose in order to saturate the uh, uh, cartridge and then we reach therapeutic levels in the patient. Or because these sessions normally last between four and eight hours and then they are interrupted to permit uh, the re-equilibration from the interstitial phase uh, into the vascular space, uh, the administration of antibiotics in the intertreatment period uh, so that we will have uh, for sure the dose uh, directly uh, delivered to the patient. But it is a very important uh, issue, of course, especially if the drugs are uh, somehow in part protein bound because then uh, the kinetics is still different uh, because uh, it depends on what 
level of linkage you have. If it is a very weak, like depending on Van der Waal forces or uh, ionic bonds, then there is a continuous uh, uh, equilibrium between the free phase and the bound phase. But if the link is uh, covalent uh, or hydrophobic bonds, then the drug is strongly bound to proteins and does not lead to free components. So it has to be considered. Uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, need to do a lot of research. But not knowing that you don't know is the good start according to the Galilean method. Uh, and uh, Galileo was one of the professors at my university a few years ago. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so I think that this time we'll be inviting William Bernal, if I'm not wrong, to talk about um, when do treatments become futile. Hi, um, good morning. Um, got my first slide. I hope. I'm pushing. Nothing seems to be happening. Do you, do you have any slides? I do have slides and they were loaded. I was talking to the gentleman at the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows what's going on. Ah, oh, here we go. So, um, so the title that I've been asked to talk to is that of uh, uh, liver failure. When does uh, treatment become futile? These are my disclosures. Um, and in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, what I'd like to cover is this. I'll talk a little bit about the language that we use in this setting. Is this futile or inappropriate treatment? Because I think the language is important. I'm going to be talking about patients with chronic liver disease, not acute liver failure. And I'll give you some context about the outcomes of patients with chronic liver disease in the ICU. I'll then make some observations about the way we use prognostic scoring in this setting. Um, and then a few perhaps slightly provocative observations about stigma and its influence upon decision making in the ICU. Um, and finally, I'll close with some observations about the framework that I personally use to, to try and make these sorts of very difficult decisions. So first of all, is this futile or is this inappropriate treatment? Um, in preparation, I went back to the, uh, the paper from the SCCM Medical Ethics Committee, and actually they provide a clear distinction between futile and inappropriate therapy. And futile doesn't seem to be the preferred uh, term that we use here. Futile should only be used in the rare circumstances that an intervention simply cannot accomplish the intended physiologic goal, and clinicians should not provide futile interventions. Perhaps the preferred term that we should be used is inappropriate. So ICU interventions can generally be considered inappropriate when there is no reasonable expectation that the patient will improve sufficiently to survive outside the acute care setting. And I put no reasonable expectation in bold here because I think this just illustrates some of the difficulties with this, this definition and the subjectivity that's involved in, in making such decisions. So what about outcomes for patients with chronic liver disease in the ICU? I think the general perception is that they are poor and there is evidence to suggest that this is actually the case. This is data from a meta-analysis published a few years ago summarising more than 2,500 patients' experience from 13 studies. Importantly, this was between 1995 and 2012, which I'll come back to, but as you can see, mortality from this cohort was extremely high. ICU mortality, more than 40%. Hospital mortality, more than 50% and only a quarter of these patients were alive six months after um, ICU admission. So short and medium term outcomes are poor, and they go on dying. This is data from a national study from Scotland using linked patient data sets. Again, between 2005 and 2010, 2,500 patients here with alcohol-related chronic liver disease, and compared to about 6,000 matched controls, either those with a mixture of chronic comorbidities or uh, a mixed age and sex matched um, population of general ICU patients. And as you can see, throughout the five years after an ICU admission, the experience of survival in patients with alcohol-related disease is inferior to these two control groups. And uh, fewer than 20% of these patients were alive six months, sorry, five years after their ICU um, admission. So short and 
short, medium, and long-term outcomes are poor for these patients. So making decisions about whether care is inappropriate is a real clinical reality here. So what can we say about prognostic scoring? How can they help us to make the decision that there is no reasonable expectation of survival for these patients? I would suggest that this is about clinical judgment that's supported by rather than defined by prognostic scores. These are a tool to help us. Which score should we be using? Um, there's not a whole lot to choose between them. This is data from 900 patients from our centre. Again, a relatively early cohort comparing five different scoring systems applied on admission to discriminate between ICU survivors and non-survivors. And actually, there's not a whole lot to choose between these. The confidence intervals overlap, but actually the SOFA and probably the Cliff SOFA appear to be the best performing scores. And I'll come back to what the Cliff SOFA is about shortly. But one of the messages that comes through from the literature fairly consistently is, is that actually if you delay your assessment using a scoring system, performance is better. And this is just illustrated here with the MELD, SOFA and CLIF SOFA scores compared between admission and 72 hours after admission. And what you can see is at least for the SOFA and CLIF SOFA score, discrimination improves if you delay assessment. So don't make your assessment on the basis of findings on admission. Wait a few days. I mentioned the Cliff SOFA score. Some in the audience may be unfamiliar with this. In essentially, this is a, a, a variant of the SOFA score with six different organ systems defined um, from zero to, to four, depending on the degree of dysfunction, but with some important changes from the standard SOFA score. Um, in place of the neurologic score, we have hepatic encephalopathy grade. In place of coagulation, we have the INR. And in place of uh, the standard vasopressors, we introduced terlipressin here as well. So, so there are some slight changes. Additionally, rather than just accepting a score of three points as representing organ systems failure, we use different thresholds. So the organ system thresholds representing failure are shown here in, in green. And as you've heard earlier on, this has transformed the way we can categorise the condition. So we now have ways of defining ACLF into three key grades. ACLF1 <laughs> is where we have renal or cerebral failure alone or renal dysfunction with another organ failure. ACLF2 is two organ failures and ACLF3 is three or more organ system failures. And as you might expect, and as you've seen on a previous slide, there's a very close relationship between your ACLF grade and your expected survival. So here's data from our, uh, our unit where you can see patients with acute decompensation had a 90-day survival, a 90-day mortality between 10 and 15 percent, and this rose quite rapidly to more than 70 percent in those who had ACLF3. So this is a very straightforward way of, of, of stratifying these patients, and this is where it becomes a little problematic. Um, we have an easy way of describing disease severity with some implications on prognosis. And there are some authors who've suggested that this should be a key, if not the sole arbiter for, of decision making in these patients. And this is one proposed algorithm where we see um, ACLF grade performed, assessed at three to seven days after admission with an expected prognosis, consideration for liver transplantation, then rescoring. And then on the basis of this, a decision taken as to whether or not to continue or withdraw, withdraw treatment. This, I think, is, is perhaps a little simplistic because actually a whole series of things that we would think clinically are important aren't actually considered in these sorts of algorithms. There's, there's no consideration of patient wishes, assessment of age, assessment of frailty or comorbidity, all of which we know impact importantly here. Additionally, the, the, the perceptions of what is inappropriate care may vary very significantly between caregivers and, and patients and their families. A 90% mortality may represent a 10% chance of survival, depending on how you look. Additionally, for such a major irrevocable decision, we really need to have exceptional confidence in the test that we're applying here. And I'm not sure that the accuracy that we've got for these tests is quite there yet. And part of the, the problem is that actually, as I'll show you, the outcomes for patients with chronic liver disease in ICU are changing quite significantly. And we've got some really important new therapies. So this is just illustrated here, the point of, of, about changing outcomes for patients with cirrhosis. This is a, a single center study using a slightly different score. This is the CLIF CACLF score, which is the CLIF organ failures with the introduction of age and white blood cell count. And it's a linear score from zero to 100. And the authors here observed that actually there's quite a good cutoff between, um, between survivors and non-survivors with a particular threshold of the CLIF-AD score. 
Um, and what they propose on the basis of this is actually once you hit this particular threshold, you should potentially withdraw care. Again, there are some issues with this, and I think one of the principal ones is, is that this is a, a relatively historic cohort, and this is something that we see in a number of these studies. Because actually what we see is that, as I say, outcomes have changed for patients. This is data from a national study in the United Kingdom looking at more than 33,000 patients with cirrhosis admitted to the ICU. Um, from the ICNARC data set, um, over the time period from 1998 to 2012. And what you can see here, if you look at the physiologic scores for these admissions, actually they haven't changed significantly over the time period. What we do see is a highly significant and progressive reduction in mortality for these patients. So actually, despite being equivalently sick when they come in, they do better. And we've seen similar information from other data sets. This is recently published national data from coding data from hospital admissions here with patients with cirrhosis uh, uh, from Germany. 2.3 million admissions with cirrhosis. And what you can see is that over the period 2005 to 2018, we've seen a more than 20% reduction in, in mortality for these patients. So outcomes have changed and there are some new therapies and one of the, one of the things that hasn't been touched on in, in, in this particular forum and maybe will be a subject for, for future uh, sessions in this meeting is the use of liver transplantation for acute on chronic liver failure. For some patients this is going to be a complete game changer. Um, we're now starting to look at how we can use this in patients with HCLF. This is recent data from prospective data from, from a pan-European study looking at the outcomes of transplantation for ICU for patients in HCLF. And you can see that we're now getting more than a nearly 80% survival in patients trans at one year for patients transplanted with HCLF3. So, what about stigma and decision making? A slightly uncomfortable subject. Does it actually impact some of the decisions that we make with patients with chronic liver disease? Um, I think at least from the United Kingdom, there is evidence that this is the case. And part of this is perhaps prejudice that arises from the perceived self-inflicted uh, nature of, the, of liver disease that we see. So this is either from, oops, sorry, this, I don't think I go back. This is either from, uh, alcohol or drugs or obesity, all of which um, may be perceived as being self-inflicted with a high chance of recurrence if they survive their ICU admission. Does this influence clinician decision-making? Certainly in the UK we have evidence that this is the case. These are data, this is, a, this is quotations from a report 10 years ago now from the UK where we did a national snapshot of the outcomes of patients who died with alcoholic liver disease in, in, in UK hospitals. More than 600 cases were scrutinized by uh, advisors and clinicians. And what the conclusions were were that advisors and clinicians identified patients in whom escalation of care was not received despite it being indicated and that they made the specific recommendation that escalation of care should be actively pursued for patients with alcohol-related liver disease who deteriorate acutely and whose background functional status is good. And that they recommended specifically that there should be close liaison between medical and critical care teams when making escalation decisions. And this was uh, quite significant for the United Kingdom. So we followed this up with a report um, that was published at the beginning of this year. We returned to the same process, looked again at whether things had changed, and actually they hadn't changed very much. No. The, uh, the assessors noticed here was that in more than a quarter of hospitals, the responding physicians said they found it more difficult to have their patients with decompensated alcohol-related liver disease admitted to critical care. And they made the slightly bold statement that actually admission of alcohol-related liver disease patients is highly dependent on the ICU physician in attendance and that stigma of alcohol-related liver disease as perceived by ICU physician counts against patients. And this counted both for the admission to ICU, but also about withdrawal of care. So how can we bring this together? Um, in summary, I, I'd suggest that critical illness in patients with cirrhosis is associated clearly with high, short, medium and long-term mortality. That it is probably higher than other chronic comorbidities and the general ICU population and that limiting inappropriate care is a clinical reality. But I would suggest that mortality has shown progressive improvement over time, that liver transplantation is likely to be transformative for some patients, but not all, that preconceptions and stigma may impact treatment decisions, and that poor ICU survival in this respect may be a self-fulfilling prophecy.
So what's the framework that I would use to try and approach this particular question? How can we assess if there's a reasonable expectation that the patient won't improve sufficiently to get out of hospital? First of all, it's the usual ICU assessment. Think about age, comorbidity, frailty, physical reserve. Consider the patient's family, uh, a patient and family wishes and their expectations. Then think, is liver transplantation an option? And this is important, and actually engaging your hepatologist and discussing with your transplant centre may be helpful here. Then suggest, assess the severity of liver disease, the multiple organ failure and its trajectory, and scores such as the CLIF SOFA or CLIF CACLF score are helpful here, but you need to recognise their limitations, and perform these three to seven days after admission, and remain conscious of your own decision making. And if you conclude that continued aggressive ICU management won't actually alter the outcome, this is the time when you need to think, well, this is probably burdensome and not beneficial, and it may well be inappropriate to continue. And this is where I think you should engage your palliative care service early. And with that, I'll close, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.